Hey, LA Progressive uh, readers, uh, we're back again. We're back again with our dear friend, Peter Larman, a retired uh, uh, minister we worked with for years on a project called Justice Not Jails. He he uh, couldn't take Los Angeles and ran off to Rhode Island, but we still get to talk to him now and then. And in your, your latest article, you, you talk about uh, Christian Zionists, uh, 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 groups of uh, white uh, right-wing Christians that are vociferously uh, supporting Zionists in Israel. And to somebody who's not deep into those things, that doesn't make much sense. Uh, but maybe maybe you could start by by uh, giving us your perspective on, on what, what is anti-Semitism. Yeah, and, and let me also, good to see you, first of all. Uh, let me also just say, I wrote this in part because I think a lot of people assume that um, the entire Zionist project, we'll call that, the entire Zionist project and the crushing of the Palestinians, the subordination of Palestinians, that that's entirely related to Jews in Israel and Jews in the United States. There are also these Christians there. But I, I would like to talk just for a little bit about anti-Semitism, and I'll begin with an item that's been in the news that that um, that actually beggars the imagination, if I can use that term. So, you know, both chambers of Congress, which don't do anything else, passed a resolution condemning the the protests and 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 denouncing anti-Semitism as a problem. Uh, interestingly, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, Bobert and those people said, "Does this mean?" that we as Christians can no longer say that the Jews killed Christ. Um, we object to this. This is, a, this is, this is going to uh, prevent us from telling our gospel truth. Was the Jews had, you know, the Jews crucified Jesus. Wow. When I saw that, I thought to myself, okay, so there is this big block of people, white Christian nationalists for the most part, who actually are not biblically or religiously literate at all, because the idea that the Jews killed Christ is an age-old canard. It's, you know, the blood libel. The Jews call it the blood libel. It's it's at the root of a tremendous amount of anti-Jewish hatred over the years. Um, James Carroll, who used to write for the Boston Globe, a really good author, uh, a Roman Catholic chained by, uh, trained by Jesuits, really went deep into the formation of anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism in the early formation of the Christian church. So initially, the Jesus followers were Jews. They weren't anti-Semitic, they were Jews, or they weren't anti-Judaic, because to be a Christian, you had to be a Jew first. But then, about 150 years after the death of Jesus, the position of Christians hardened because they thought that the Jews would convert, and they didn't. So now there's this hostility, and there's this, this in the in the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, the, the term the Jews, the Jews, the Jews is used all the time. And that's at the root of a lot of this. The other canard used against Jewish people is that somehow Jews are uniquely avaricious, right? And interestingly, again, the Christians, this is projection, the Christians in the Middle Ages couldn't lend money at interest because at that time the church was still no usury. It's very clear, no usury. We don't allow that. The Christians, in effect, made... Jews become moneylenders and then blame them for it. Right. right. So this too is rooted in deep history. And then I think, you know, the the other canard that uh, goes back to Henry Ford and Adolf Hitler is, is, well, the Jews secretly run the world. And of course, the laugh has always been, how can the Jews be communists on the one hand and capitalists on the other? You know, <laughs> pick one. Um, I've My whole life, given my age, uh, and especially as a Christian minister, minister, I've been really, really careful about respecting the problem, respecting Jews who are deeply concerned about anti-Semitism. In this, in this Palestinian solidarity movement, however, as we know, the charge of anti-Semitism is waved over everything, like you know the bloody shirt in the Civil War era, uh, like you know, by questioning. What Israel is doing, what the state of Israel and Netanyahu are doing, you are by definition anti-Semitic, and that's that's uh, that's really really uh, horrendous. That's that's really horrendous. And so, 
the Bidens of the world, the moderate Democrats, you know, they're like, well, their first reflex is to say, uh, on the one hand, what's happening in Israel and, and the suffering of the Palestinians is horrible. On the other hand, there's anti-Semitism, as though somehow it's okay that two million people are at the brink of starvation, disease, killing from the air, uh, because after all, there's anti-Semitism in the world. That's that's horrendous. Now, to turn the conversation where where I'm meant to go at the beginning. So these Christians, and they're up there. They're overwhelmingly white Christians, overwhelmingly in the South. They're, they're kind of figurehead is this guy named Hagee, John Hagee, who has a mere 25,000 members in his megachurch in San Antonio. I should say 25,000 gun-toting members in his church in San Antonio. But he's he's made hay, if I could use that term. You know, he's raised money and so forth, fomenting this love of the Jewish people and this intense uh, push, a lobbying push, which Jared Kushner and Mike Pompeo and the Trump administration took full advantage of to move the capital to Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel to Jerusalem, um, and to crack down on the on the West Bank to take over all of the housing in East Jerusalem. Horrible things, completely endorsed by these Christians. And you might ask yourself, wait a minute, these are Southern ignorant Christians. Clearly, if you ask them about all this stuff about Christ killers and stuff, they'd say, yeah, the Jews killed Christ. Absolutely, they did. <laughs> right? But therefore, what the state of Israel is doing now, they are Christian Zionists, and they're powerful. They're well-connected. There's a lot of money in Texas. There's a lot of money in these states. There's this whole secret network, not very public, of people who, who support Israel, who are Christians, American Christians. Why is that? It's not because they love Jews. It's because uh, in their idea of biblical prophecy, Christ won't come again unless the second temple is rebuilt on the Temple Mount, right? So, of course, that mosque has to go, and the Arabs have to be you know destroyed. Then Christ will come, but, and here's why I advise Israelis not to take this kind of help, then Christ will come and the Jews will go poof. Are you with me? I know yeah. that sounds bizarre, but no, that's no. their but that is their belief. Now, you know, there's uh a pretty, you know, hard edged Zionism in this Christian group because their view is it's okay for the state of Israel to show no mercy at all, to liquidate these people. Uh, uh, as though, you know, this is the Wild West and they're, you know, the Native Americans who have to be uprooted. Um, uh, uh, and it's a softer version of that, which is um, Israel, uh, as an idea at least, is does belong to the Jewish people. I think a lot of Christians uh, feel that way. It's, they don't know what kind of Israel that would be, not necessarily a militant one, but the idea that the Jews ought to have a homeland is pretty widespread in uh, in Christianity. And, and again, if I can just say one more thing historically, you know, all this grew out of the British mandate. The British got control of that whole region after the Second World War. They took it over from the Ottoman Empire. So they just drew lines in the desert, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, all that kind of stuff. They're running around there with their little pith helmets on. And... Uh, these are, you know, these are imperialists. This is the high watermark of British imperialism. Um, and they said their prime minister and their uh, foreign minister uh, were evangelical Christians. They're high class people. Lord Shaftesbury, the seventh Earl, this guy, Arthur Balfour, uh, who was made an Earl uh, for his service to the crown. Uh, they said, well, the Jews are kind of a pest around here. We don't we don't want them here. They've been thrown out of England, you know, centuries ago for the most part, um, and they're a problem as a restless, uh, as they said, deracinated people living in European capitals. What if we give them this this homeland? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Because in a way, it kind of corresponds to their Christian idea that the Jews belong there, but it also allows them to say these are European Jews. They will do our bidding in that part of the world. That is to say, they will control 
the Arabs, although if I were Lord Shaftesbury, I would say the filthy Arabs, right? Uh, so the so the Jewish people, beginning uh, at the you know in the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and onward, become kind of policemen for European interests in the Middle East. That's a softer version of Zionism than the Hagee, you know, crazy current U.S. kind. Um, but it's it's you know can't understand any of this stuff without understanding the backstory of the the fight over the Middle East that goes back to at least the ninth century. Right, right. So it's one of the reasons that we love having you here, Peter, is because you are steeped in history. And it's my belief that it's impossible to understand the legacies that history um, has left us with if we don't understand history itself. And while you call, call um, the, Balfour, um, the Balfour Declaration um, the softer, I think it's really at the root. And what's happening with white Christian nationalists in this country, I um, have an analogy in my mind of pretextual stops. When police pull black people over for driving while black, but they'll say that they're pulling you over because you have a um, an expired uh, registration or your windows are too tinted or you've your, got- your, your blinker, your blinker doesn't right. work. Yeah. Right, and, yeah. and so, so therefore we need to uh, pull you over and oh, by the way, we're probably gonna end up killing you, but we're, <laughs> we're gonna do something really bad. And I think that that is what we see playing out here with these people who say that they are um, Christian Zionists. I don't think that they're really steeped in history or in un any understanding of the past, but they have a desire to hurt people, to control, and to exert their power. And so they're going to use this as a pretext. That, in my heart of heart, is what's going on. And the Balfour uh, Declaration is where it stems from. But even before 1917 in the Balfour Declaration, there were hints of what was hap what eventually happened with Jews in Europe. Yeah. What's, what's um, your take on that? Yeah, uh, I absolutely think you're right. So uh, Moses Herzog is often thought of the initiator. So already in the 1870s, 1880s, he's having chats, he's having conferences. Uh, uh, he was, he and others we're like, if only Lord Rothschild, you know, a prominent Jewish financier, if only Lord Rothschild would side with us, we might be able to do this. Eventually, Rothschild did uh, uh, side with this. There were many, many uh, leaders, intellectual leaders in the Jewish community and uh, highly regarded rabbis who said, this is a trap. This is a trap. Jewish people are... are uh, we have been exiled. We will not be restored until the Messiah comes. And our belief, the Messiah has not come. So if we go for this uh, uh, territorial thing, it can only be trouble for us. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to take away from the idea that the Jewish tradition is a tradition of time, that, that, that we live in time, not necessarily in uh, uh, place. Then... So this was an open debate. Then, of course, when the Holocaust happens, everything changes. When the Holocaust happens, it's like, oh, okay, we're never going to be allowed to live in, in peace, certainly not in Poland, not in uh, Germany, uh, you know, we're, we're not in uh, Holland, not even in France. Uh, we're desperate. We're freaked out. Uh, we, we need this. And that's when, in fact... Um, do you remember Menachem Begin? Mm -hmm. yeah, that name ring a bell? Yeah. Menachem Begin goes back to the dates of the, you know, the Irgun, the armed people who participated in ethnic cleansing uh, at the at the point of the formation of the state. They were the shock troops of the settlement uh, of that land, and um, and that's where the wound. And this is why this is why again it just breaks my heart that to see people wave this anti-Semitism flag to say there are two sides here. Uh, yes, what happened on October seventh is atrocious. Nobody denies that. Nobody denies that. But but the systematic persecution of women and children, old people, right? The starvation, the 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 pestilence. I mean, the uh, in the West uh, Bank, some of the militant. 
settlers, Jewish settlers, uh, when the relief got through, that the, Blinken was actually standing there. That he, Blinken was our Secretary of State, was standing there saying, "Great, some some aid is going to go through the north into the north from Jordan." As soon as that those trucks started to roll through the West Bank, these militant West Bank settlers attacked the trucks, and they said, "Well, we don't want these people to have any food. We're starving them out. Just just blatantly, just that blatantly." Right. I mean, that that should be intolerable. And in effect, that's uh, they won't say it, but that's also Netanyahu's thing. He's he if if he can't find Hamas leadership in the tunnels and he won't find Hamas leadership in the tunnels, because, as you said, Sharon, they're everywhere. Right. Not necessarily in the West Bank. Um, he'll you know, he'll he'll a lot of people will have to starve for this phantom hunt for the leadership. And he hasn't he has yet to say that he won't invade Rafa. Yeah, so if that, ha if, if, that I, if that ha if that happens, I think all bets are off. I don't know what will happen in the world if he does that. So I, I think what has happened as bad as October 7th has been, uh Israel has managed to turn it around as a pretext to what it's been doing over decades. I saw, uh, I think, a New York Times article recently where they're moving in heavy equipment to knock down several thousand Palestinian homes so that settlers that have taken over much of Palestine could move in. Uh, and, and you look at the, the pictures of the devastation that's been wrought in Gaza, and there's really no place for people to move back to. Uh, they've destroyed all the hospitals. They've destroyed all the... Uh, all the universities, and I, I think it's I think it's a pretty cynical. And then then if you say that, then you're anti-Semite. But we were talking before we started about the the idea that uh, you know a week ago, the last time we talked, there were there were campus protests. They they were large. They were noisy. Uh, maybe on the edges, they were inappropriate, but they were largely peaceful. And in the week that's happened since then, well, first of all, there's been massive crackdowns by law enforcement, but that we've also seen a an upsurge in provocateurs, uh, Zionist provocateurs who have promoted uh, violence in these events, especially here in UCLA, uh, to somewhat in, in Columbia, New York City, USC was shut down and lost their commitments, commencement. To, what do you think about that? Yeah, it, it's it's uh, hair raising uh, to watch that develop. And a, a good friend of mine who uh, uh, teaches philosophy and uh, uh, Jewish studies at UCLA, David Myers, was uh, quoted, I think, in the New York Times, saying, "This is a uh, chilling new development, not entirely unpredictable." His comment is, uh, "If it spreads." Who know who knows where this will uh who knows where this will end up the the deeper problem however is that the rhetoric of uh the so-called Democratic Party mainstream has really turned ugly uh in terms of these uh protests in terms of the the extent of the endorsement because why because they don't want Trump to have that issue you know sort of like the border right they don't want they, they don't want the Republicans to own this issue of uh, disorder, chaos, uh, you know, violent people wearing uh, wearing Pal Palestinian garb. Um, that's that to me is um, is uh, uh, the most concerning thing of all. Um, if they're not going to stop the the. Uh, and this is why the moderate Democrats, and I'm, you know, I guess I'm a progressive Democrat, but the the moderate Democrats seem to be uh, oblivious to this. If they uh, yield to this hard right initiative, which is led by by people who are um, completely unsavory, people like Christopher Rufo, right? I mean, Christopher Rufo's other project is to root out DEI, to root out diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? To uh, you know, get rid of uh, of uh, any college curricula that dare to talk about the actual history of the United States or racial justice. Um, 
it's for them, it's sort of one project and they see this opening. Um, it, it, you know, I don't know what Eric Adams, the mayor of New York is, is doing, but uh, his rhetoric is it's somewhat representative. I mean, he's completely on the side of, you know, sending the cops, clean these fuckers out. Pardon my language. Right. Um, I, it, it, I guess in that city, he thinks it's going to play to his advantage politically, but it's, uh, it's uh it's it's atrocious um the other thing of course that uh, when when this uh blanket labeling of anti-semitism is dropped the other thing that's completely obscured is that i think on almost all campuses certainly uh in here in providence at brown it's jewish students it's jews for ceasefire now and Jew, Jew, uh, jewish voice for peace it's jewish students were in the leadership of this so uh, does this mean that the that the uh, you know the uh, Stefanic uh, types of the world, uh, at least Stefanic and uh, Virginia Fox, does this mean that uh, they get to say that all these uh, Jewish kids who are in can in tents and and uh, risking their careers are self hating Jews? Right. Yes, of course. You've heard that before, right? Yes, yes, ab absolutely. So, so where do we go from here? Um, I mean, I mean, the three of us obviously, all we do is re report on it and talk about it. But is this a? It's many people have been comparing this to 1968, um, as if like as if 1968 was a precursor to this, or there are a lot of similarities. And and I think that there probably are a lot of similarities. And and in the comparison, what becomes apparent to me is that this has been an ongoing struggle. Um, even, of course, obviously before 1968, when you think about the 1967 um, war and what was going on in 1968 and the civil rights movement and the, the women's movement, this is a toggle um, between the um, deep pocketed, powerful who are really using the masses on the right, and the rest of us. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, uh, Sharon. And you know, uh, I keep hearing pundits, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable who gets paid to make comments like this, but I keep hearing some of our leading pundits say, well, wouldn't it be uh, ironic if the protests somehow led to a Trump uh, victory? And uh, when I hear that kind of talk, I say, all right, so, um, and I say this to, you know, my comrades, my colleagues, my the people who are like me in solidarity with the Palestinian people to the greatest extent possible. What it says to me is our move, to answer your question finally, uh, our move is to put maximum pressure on every Democrat we can get our hands on to say, you need to fix this you need to lean on biden hard much harder uh and, and you know biden continues to say i i my hands are i i'm taking a hands-off policy israel is a sovereign country um we're not going to tell them what to do um well it's time first of all that's a fiction yes israel is a, a sovereign country it wouldn't be sovereign for five minutes without the full backing of the United States, protecting it from international sanctions, sending all the weapons. Interestingly, I heard Biden say, we may not get the weapons to Ukraine fast enough. In the case of Israel, the weapons are there in five seconds, right? Um, and these are the weapons that are killing these people. Where do you think, Dick, that heavy equipment that's going to you know, uh, create new settlements, where do you think that that came from? Right. right? Um, so uh, it's on... Biden. I don't want to be told by some, you know, pundit. Uh, it's, that's too flattering a term. I don't want to be told by some uh, tyrant that I'm contributing to Trump's election because I'm speaking out about the about the uh, massacre. You know, this business about is it a genocide or is it just a whole lot of war crimes? I don't. I think that's a distinction without a difference. I don't. I don't insist on calling it a genocide. What I do see, though, is multiple sustained, deliberate war crimes. You know, there are rules about that. Um, 
Uh, it's on right. Biden to end. It's on Biden to end that. It is on Biden to end that. Uh, his his problem is, uh, you know, he would be perceived as pushing out Netanyahu, casting Netanyahu to the to the to the to the winds. Who cares? Who cares? Netanyahu should be in jail. You know, he's a he's a completely corrupt person. Yeah. Right. Uh, Thirty five thousand dead Palestinians. Don't care what you call it. They're still dead. Yeah. There's and gonna the, be and the hundred thousand have been wounded and injured and starving. In the in the end, I believe, uh, and I you know I say this uh, with no joy at all. I think there'll be one half million Palestinians, uh, uh, overwhelmingly in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, who will end up dead. Wow, that's a lot of people. Yeah, this is a, a pretty glum time. Um, we're delighted to, to talk to you as always, Peter. We can't wait for your next article and we'll connect with you again. And we urge our readers and our listeners to like and share this content. We also urge you to contact your congressional representative and put some pressure on them. We can't act like this is just normal to, to have babies starving, to not have medical um, support to, to all of their schools, their homes demolished. And why? Because we're providing the weaponry and the funds to make it happen. They could not have done this without the United States. And also, I would say to our, our viewers and our readers, uh, don't fall for the White House propaganda when they say, oh, the food's starting to come in now. Uh, uh, don't take their word for it. Don't take their word for it. I mean, these are photo ops, um, uh, that little pier that, you know, in the in the Mediterranean, it's it's a, basically a photo op. It's 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 to it's to try to smooth this over and say there's nothing to see here. And in fact, there's a lot to there's a lot to see here. People should trust what they read in L.A. Progressive, Democracy Now. Um, you know, yeah. don't take their word for it. Right, there's plenty. Truth dig, um, uh, truth out. Mother Jones, the Nation, Independent Media. You've got to oh. rely on independent media. Al Jazeera, except except the Netanyahu government is shutting down Al, Al Jazeera uh, coverage. They've banned yeah. Al Jazeera. Of course they have. Of course they have. They can't handle it. Okay. All Pete. right. This is this is this is all too grim. Let's try to uh, enjoy the spring and uh, and get our energy up to do the work we have to do. Absolutely. Take care, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.